Vanuatu archipelago, a cluster of volcanic islands in the Pacific, about 1,000 miles east of northern Australia. Below, the village of Endur on the island of Ambrim. A year ago, most of it was destroyed by a tropical storm of phenomenal force. But the village also has to endure the periodic fallout of volcanic eruptions. Punctuated by catastrophes, time does not seem to have found a grip on the community. We met Chief Mile Moses here with members of his large family. This is Clive Oppenheimer, a volcanologist from Cambridge University who brought us to this place. Chief Mile Moses, you're the head of this beautiful village of Endu, just a few kilometers from the volcano crater. You visited the crater and looked yourself into the inferno, into the raging fire. How did you feel when you went there? The, I feel very frightened to look at the fire. Secondly, I, I feel that uh, I was not in the island of Ambra. I thought I was somewhere else. And uh, the other thing, I feel that how powerful that fire is. Do spirits live in the fire? That's how we believe that spirits are in the fire. The fire is burning through that spirit. We believe that the fire is burning through that spirit. I read that there was a big eruption in 1968 and that there were rituals performed to stop the eruption. And then uh, tourists were not allowed for three years afterwards to visit the crater, and because it was seen that somehow the, the tourists had started the eruption, is that? Well, we believe that because uh, we thought that the spirits that are in the volcano, if they look at you, they don't know who is this, okay? But if they look at some swallows, they know that uh, because we are more or less related to the volcano, then they will, they will just be quiet. Sometimes we say that the tourists won't go up there, okay? because you are, you are foreigners to that spirit, the volcano. <laughs> Once I came about the volcano, I saw people in that fire. People, and women and men, they cooking their food in there. It makes me believe that there are somebody who is the spirit out there. The molten rock is that part of the spirit. The lava expresses the angriness of the devil who are living in that fire volcano. Do the ancestors then live under the volcano? If we believe that uh, anybody who dies here goes to the volcano, and that volcano has become the village where you can talk to them and we can talk to, they can talk to us. Can you talk to the volcano? I'm not, because, uh, you know, I, I'm not related to the volcano. But my, my, one of my brothers, yes, he was talking to the volcano. His father, his father, when he goes up to the volcano, and uh, if he wants to smoke, he just call out and the fire will come down and take the fire and make his cigarette or uh, pipe or something like that. And, and if your brother talks to the volcano, is he allowed to tell you what the volcano has said or is it just a secret no, for him? No, it's a secret for him. Yes. Do you try and get the secret out of him? I've got some. <laughs> but Chief Nile Moses is worried about the loss of their ancient culture. He asked us to follow him to a ritual site in the jungle. Once upon a time, our people were cannibals. They, they, they see somebody and they would like to attack him and kill him so that they should use it for a meat. And this is how they demonstrated. Many people here have lost the dance. 
they have, have not the idea of dancing. Yes. The custom dance that we, we're going to see to this afternoon, my, just my family will perform the dance. It's a happier dance, the happiest dance. After we've gone through a long suffering, then we are happy to go back and dance, to express ourselves. scientists from Vanuatu. For you, is it strange to imagine that someone would come here to work, to study how the volcano works, how it erupts? I'm very surprised to hear that you people are very interested in the volcano. I always ask myself, why do these people want to do with that fire? Okay? <laughs> when looking at this, going to in the helicopter yesterday, I was wondering, why this man is going, he wanted to, to do with a bad volcano, okay? <laughs> yes, I, I don't know why, why you are so interested in volcano. In a way, this film started for me 10 years ago in Antarctica. I was doing a film about scientists on this continent, which took me to Mount Erebus, an active volcano, one of the three in the world, where you can look straight into the magma of the inner earth. Magma is the heated molten rock from which lava can be extruded. It was on Erebus, 12,500 feet above sea level, that I met a strange and wonderful tribe of volcanologists, some of them overcome by altitude sickness. close to the boiling magma which frequently explodes we were briefed on the etiquette of how to deal with the stuff. One uh, very important thing to keep in mind when you're on the crater is that the lava lake could explode at any time. If it does, it's vital to keep your attention face toward the lava lake and watch for bombs that are tracking up into the air and try to pick out the ones that might be coming toward you and step out of the way. The last thing you want to do is turn away from the crater, or run, or crash down. Keep your attention toward the lava lake, look up, and move out of the way. What really impressed me was seeing these scientists toiling up the side of the volcano with such heavy loads. The temperature on this particular morning was minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The place is frozen. <laughs> One of them stood out. Despite having a fantastic lava lake down there, all that energy, we still have to bring old petrol generators up to the crater end. The end of machine, chapter 53. Professor Clive of Dublin, I'm nervous. Hands in pockets. Waiting for it to start spontaneously. <laughs> They're waiting a long time. <laughs> I've never seen three men face like this before. I like working with Harry. Oh. All right, thanks. It was easy to start a friendship with him. On one of our first days together, he insisted upon training his own camera on me. 
you know, do you see them only in, in destructive terms? Okay. No, I, I do not. Uh, something different. It's good that they are there and uh, the soil they are walking upon uh, is not permanent. There's no permanence to, to what we are doing. No permanence to the efforts of human beings. No permanence to art. No permanence to science. There is something of a, of a crust that is somehow moving and it makes me fond of the volcano to know that uh, our life, human life, uh, animals can only live and survive because the volcanoes created the atmosphere they need. Do you have a sense of the different kinds of volcanoes in different eruptions? I know you filmed uh, on La Sofia de Guadalupe many years ago, uh, which is a very well, do, do you sense differences in, in the activity here? With... <coughs> yeah, La Sofia was very volatile. It was all the way back in 1976 when I first filmed the volcano. This was on the Caribbean island of Guadeloupe. The mountain was expected to explode at any moment and 70,000 people were rapidly evacuated. The fear was intense because of the memory of an event that took on apocalyptic proportions. It was known that uh, in 1902, uh, on the neighboring island Martinique, uh, Montagne really exploded. The signals that uh, uh, La Sofia issued were uh, almost identical to what had happened, but it was measured in 1902, so everybody was afraid it would explode, and it would explode with uh, very, very massive force, many times uh, atomic bomb, Hiroshima size. So I was not interested in the volcano. I was interested in one single man who refused to be evacuated. A different attitude towards death. 75 people, 75,000 people being evacuated and he stayed on. I actually found him, <laughs> I find him sleeping. I find him sleeping, I had to wake him up on camera. And what was wonderful, he was very philosophical, a very poor black farmer. And I, I sensed that after a while he didn't feel so comfortable with us anymore and he sat up and started to tie his uh, worn out tennis shoe. And then all of a sudden he sings a song against the camera and I knew that was that song over it, we better get out. Je suis ici au Gamon, on la voyant si belle. Si vous êtes sans plaisir, c'est une triste l'esclavage. Si on travaille, on va gagner, mon père. We met. In Antarctica during the shoot of Encounters at the End of the World. And I knew a little bit about you. I'd seen some of your movies when I was a, a youngster. And uh, I knew something of your reputation. And uh, we, in our, in our field team, we were, we were anxious that uh, you, were, you were going to have us propelled down towards the lava lake. There was some concern that you would be looking for lengths of rope with which we could be lowered down within meters of this fiery lake on Mount Erebus volcano. And instead, you, you, were, you were interested in what we were doing and why we were doing it. For me, there's no personal excitement to, to go down. There's a curiosity, as I, I would love to see it from close up. But since it is too, too dangerous, it would be silly. We, we have it in some ways similar um, you know, we both, we, as a volcanologist, of course, there's a risk yeah. doing, doing the measurements and, and you, you ask yourself, well, is, is it worth dying to get this measurement? And, and the, the answer is no, if you look at it in, in those terms, but you're always trying to evaluate how far you're going to tolerate the risk. I mean, even yeah. here, the, the, the volcano could explode now and, and you'll still be hit by one of these five-meter yeah. bombs. I'm the only one in filmmaking who is clinically sane, Sorry, taking yeah. all precautions. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you wouldn't still be here if you, if you were insane. You would have been consumed long ago by a pyroclastic current or a gas flare or a grizzly bear or whatever. Uh, so it's quite clear that you're sane. I, I never doubted that for a moment on my first encounter. Deposited out from the volcanic gas. We would often discuss the life and work of a French couple, Katya and Maurice Kraft. They were famous for capturing incredible images of volcanoes. But this meant 
that they had to get dangerously close to their subject. Too close, as it would eventually turn out. killed by a pyroclastic flow in Japan, together with 41 other people. This is the very avalanche of superheated gases that killed them. What is rushing down this slope at over 100 miles per hour has a temperature of more than 800 degrees Fahrenheit. I came to Togo when I was 19 years old. And actually in Indonesia, I feel like it's my second home. I've, I've come back intermittently over the years, but I immediately feel at home. The smell of the Kretek clove cigarettes, the, the sights, the sounds, it's, it's a very special place to me. And I think my career as a volcanologist was, was partly formed from that first visit as a 19 year old. Indonesia was the right place for an aspiring scientist. In fact, there's no country in the world that has more volcanoes than this one. Clive Oppenheimer took us to Mount Sinabung. It had been relatively quiet the last few years. The area we are shooting in right now had been declared a restricted zone with no access allowed to anyone. But as we found farmers working there, we felt reasonably safe. Eerie relics remained though from an eruption in 2010. Feeling that this was distant enough in time, no one was expecting what happened next. did not hurt anyone and we quickly left the area. Only a few days later we saw this on Indonesian television. Seven people were killed in the very spot where we had had our camera.
In order to prevent such catastrophes, Indonesia has set up numerous early warning systems. This is the Babadan Observatory, which monitors Mount Merapi, one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. And each of these stations is a seismometer somewhere on Merapi, a different distance, five, six kilometers from the summit. Yeah, that's true. So we have a summit station, we have a short east station, we have short station in Pelawangan Hill, and also we have on the west of uh, station. And, and these real-time data provide one of the most uh, important parts of a volcano monitoring program for assessing what the volcano is doing. It's the heartbeat of the volcano where... Exactly. Observed. This one is the electronic distance measurements. So we have a reflector in the summit of Merapi, then we measuring every morning. By this measuring, we plot in the core. So it's, it's measuring, it's firing a laser pulse to a mirror five, six kilometers away, the light bounces back and you've measured the distance. And, and that, uh, that can show whether the volcano is, is inflating because magma is rising into the cone, is that? That's right, yeah, that's the idea for this uh, electronic distance measurement. In uh, a worst case scenario, I imagine the observer is at risk if, if there's a pyroclastic flow. Uh, if it's too late for the observer to evacuate, are there any options left? Yeah, that's the emergency. Then, if it is emergency, we have a bunker. We put the food and also oxygen. We hope that they can survive for one month. It reminds me of the eruption of Montpellier in 1902 that killed nearly 30,000 people in the city of Saint Pierre as the pyroclastic flows reached it. And the only survivor lived because he was the baddest guy in town. He was, he was a criminal. I think he stabbed a prison officer uh, through the cheek with a pencil, and uh, he was put in solitary confinement in a bunker-like cell. All the other pr prisoners perished, but uh, he survived, albeit badly burned because there was a tiny grill window in the cell. And he subsequently joined the Barnum and Bailey Circus and was exhibited as, as, a, as a celebrity, as the, the sole survivor of this eruption. The first indication was uh, seismic, a lot of uh, volcanic earthquake. It indicates that there is magma moving, also supported by this electronic distance measurements. And the gas measurements? Of course. <laughs> I know this looks pathetic, like a shoebox with a baked bean tin stuck on the end. And it also looks like it's pointing at the ground rather than at the volcano summit over here. But it's something I'm very proud of. It's something that we built in Cambridge. There's a little window here and a mirror and some lenses connected to an ultraviolet spectrometer. And the device measures the emissions of sulfur dioxide from the volcano as, it, as the gases rise above the summit. And this is a very important parameter in many volcano monitoring programs around the world. And the forerunner of this device we had working here in 2010, and it played an important role in the hazard assessment. And it's conservatively, conservatively estimated that something like 20,000 lives were saved because of the effective monitoring of Morocco in 2010 and the evacuation that followed. I'm very happy to see that it's still working. Uh, I hold, uh, along with some colleagues, the patent for the original prototype, uh, which we designed more than 10 years ago now. So this technology is now found on volcanoes around the world, and, and it's revolutionized the monitoring of gas emissions from volcanoes. It's my baby. I'm really glad to see it. I haven't seen it for two years, and here it is, still working. Obviously, there was a scientific side to our journey, but what we were really chasing was the magical side, the demons, the new gods. This was the itinerary we had set for ourselves, no matter how strange things might eventually get. Here in the palace of the Sultan of Chokchakarta, dignitaries are charged with the task of reconciling the goddess of the ocean with the demon of the volcano.
The Sultan himself does not participate in the procession. We marveled at his parked Mercedes, wrapped in a bubble of plastic, as if the conceptual artist Christo had just been here. The procession stops for a ritual close to the ocean. This will be a reenactment of the sexual union between an ancient sultan and the queen of the sea. A doctoral student of Clive's, Adam Bobet, functioned as our guide. Every year they have to reproduce this by giving rituals, by doing rituals in this site and then giving offerings to the South Sea from the sultan, including his body parts, fingernails, hair, clothes, which they launch into the ocean to appease the queen of the South Sea. As a part of their sexual union, they also created a kind of monster that ended up occupying the volcano. So, so this hole is where they will give offerings, because this is the site of the sexual union between the goddess of the sea and the first sultan. I think it's coming right now. So box. This is it. to the ocean. The following day, we witnessed the ritual at the volcano. Merapi, on this morning, was not enshrouded in clouds. After the ceremony, the crowd went right for the flower pebbles, an auspicious souvenir. More strange magic. Another bewildering alignment, this time between a building and the volcano, here barely visible as if floating in the clouds. The odd edifice is still under construction. Inside, we found nobody in an empty chair pretending to watch TV. On the floor above, we met a few carpenters. Terus langsung bikin ini, bikin rumah untuk doa itu, bro. katanya ya. Seperti ya, uh, ayam. Iya, memang itu sebenarnya itu merpati ya, bukan ayam tuh. Karena matahari aja Mata. ya. Oh, ya. Oh, oh. Tapi ya. mungkin juga mungkin ada. Juga gitu, bisa oh, sampai merapi. situ. Merapi. Ya. <laughs> Kalau yang punya tanah mungkin ya, mikirnya seperti itu ya, bisa oh, oh. mengarah ke merapi mungkin bisa. Mungkin Kalau saya kan ya. nggak nyampe situ, saya mikirnya gitu. cuma pekerja harian kan saya udah. Sampai jam pulang ya pulang, nggak mikir sampai oh, itu, oh, saya oh, cuma oh, gitu. Oh, oh. Tapi ini masih dilihat ya hampir ayam ya. Iya, ya, rata-rata <laughs> memang ayam itu yang manggilnya tetap ayam itu. Saya oh, orang oh. tanya di mana-mana ya pada gereja ayam itu ngomongnya. Iya, iya, iya. Ya, ya. Oh ya dulu ada uh, kim sinetron. Ada. <laughs> Tapi yang makin ada, agak menarik kan ada itu, setengah itu. Oh, oh. Ya semua orang rata-rata sama. Sampai orang Surabaya itu pernah ke sini kemarin waktu hari Sabtu atau hari apa ya yang langsung ke sini yang itu pernah nonton film sana itu langsung mau lihat tempatnya gimana itu di daerah mana itu langsung orangnya langsung ke sini ya pernah Order still is the fact that in this mostly muslim country 
This is a Roman Catholic church. Under the floor, it even has its own catacombs, maybe as a shelter for hermits, as protection against volcanic fallout. <laughs> to a belief system. For the locals, all this volcanic landscape bears magical names. The night market of the ghosts, the flying foxes, the dancing place of the spirits. Clive Oppenheimer's scientific journey began. This is the largest volcanic crater lake on Earth. It extends something like 100 kilometers off into the distance. Frankly, it's too big to film. We should have booked a ticket on the International Space Station to look down from above and appreciate its vast scale. The eruption occurred something like 74,000 years ago. This was a monstrous, stupendous volcanic eruption, one of the very largest that we've documented in all of Earth history. For a single event. The skies would have been darkened. There would have been a conflagration across this part of northern Sumatra as the pyroclastic currents spread out radially around the crater, igniting all of the tropical vegetation. The eruption produced something like 15,000 cubic kilometers of ash and pumice that was pumped high into the stratosphere and spread across the globe. Enough pumice came out to bury everyone in the United States to a head height. It's something like 10,000 times larger than the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. It's 100,000 times greater than the Eyjafjallajökull eruption in Iceland in 2010 that disrupted global aviation. This was the stupendous event in Earth history. And there's even a theory that the eruption almost wiped us out as a species based on the genetic pedigree of living humans. We can say that there was a bottleneck in human numbers around this time period. And the link is between the climate change wrought by the eruption, the decimation of tropical vegetation that was the resource base for our ancestors. Perhaps there are as few as 600 of our species left, left on Earth. We would have been classified as an endangered species. Somehow we rebounded. This theory is very controversial, however, and that's because there's a very limited amount of evidence this far back in time. In particular, there are very few human fossils to try and establish cause and effect. If we want to find human fossils from 74,000 years ago, we better go to Ethiopia. We better go to the Afar region. This is part of the Danakil Depression, 300 feet below sea level. In terms of average year-round temperature, this is the hottest place on our planet. During summer, temperatures hardly ever dip below 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Working conditions are only tolerable in midwinter, and even then it is extremely hot. On top of that, this is an area of tribal warfare, and you can only enter it accompanied by armed soldiers. This depression is only part of a long stretch drift continuing down through all of East Africa. In millions of years, the rift will widen until a strip of the continent breaks off, drifting into the Indian Ocean. In such places, volcanoes form. 
This particular one, Erta Ali, is one of the three in the world where magma is directly exposed. important for its significance to early man. A great amount of obsidian, a volcanic glass, was extruded from the crater. Look at that, it's, uh, it's translucent at the edges. Beautiful flake. And very sharp still. You could probably shave with that. Obsidian is very hard and brittle, and therefore fractures with extremely sharp edges. So sharp, in fact, that up until the 1980s, eye operations were performed with obsidian scalpels sharper than any steel. This amazing material has attracted early humans to this landscape as far back as hominids a million years ago. At this site, a team of paleontologists are extracting artifacts and remains of our direct ancestors the first Homo sapiens, who emerged in this area 100,000 years ago. What is amazing to me is the fact that the remains are found almost directly at the surface, and more so, why this particular spot and not back there where the goats are roaming. This grid was apparently a tool manufacturing site. Hundreds of obsidian chips are strewn about. Dr. Jonathan Saleh, an Ethiopian scientist, has excavated this prehistoric workshop. And where did your passion come from? How did you fall into this field? Well, I, had, I, I studied history uh, for my bachelor's degree, and that's when I started to fall in love. But so history was not deep enough for me, so I wanted to um, look further back in time and, and find out what is it really that makes us human. We are a very unique species in a way, like we, we interact and we collaborate and we cooperate and we produce, we modify our environment. But at, this, at the same time, we fight and distract and we are even a danger to other species and the planet, the fate of the planet as well. And so we are very interesting species. So I wanted to get at the root of all this and, and see in, in deep time what underlies all these processes. We're sifting through the trash of humans from 50 to 100,000 years ago. Do you think we have another 100,000 years on planet Earth? I would say that, you know, another thousand years, we will be in a very critical uh, situation. And so we will have to learn from, from our mistakes and we'll have to work toward improving um, the condition of our planet so that it can have the, the carrying capacity to allow our species to perpetuate. If you had a time machine and could go to only one time period in the past, when would it be? It would be exactly this time period um, because this is, I believe this is when we started to look like us uh, and when uh, we as a, a species um, started. And so this is before uh, we became we, we, we acquire different skin colors. This is before we um, acquire different languages and we spread across different geographies. So this is where I want to be, right at the root. And so I would, I would love to express my, um, my fascination to this ground by kissing it. And here I go. Professor Tim White of the University of California, Berkeley, leads the team here. We were immediately captivated by his wild style of explaining things. So, look at the powder. It blows in the wind. It's very fine grain. It's all floodplain. It's all silt. But it all started as volcanic rock from the highlands, from the rift margin. Ground up over millions of years distributed out here and redistributed by the Awash River. If you die today, 
your body will decompose on the floodplain. If the hyenas don't chew all the bones up, the next time the river floods, this soft, silky material will be carried in, and it will encase your bones. Let's go. Dinga, dinga, dinga. Oh, we're going to call this the Werner Herzog Highway. And what we're doing here is opening up a space for the cars so we can come through with the full crew tomorrow morning to recover the additional pieces of the hominids that we found just up on top there in the eroding sediments. So we like to pull the cars in as close as we can get so we can get all the equipment there. And we'll start an extraction process to pull that hominid out. How phenomenally lucky are we to have arrived now and you, you found this 100,000 year old human? This does not happen very often. These hominid fossils are very, very rare. Finding an artifact, that's easy because during any hominid's lifetime, they can make dozens, thousands of stone age calling cards scattered all over the landscape, but they only have one skeleton, one dentition. They only die once. And so think about it, acres and acres of eroding sediment how in the world can we find the place where this dead person's bones came to rest and arrived just at the geological moment that erosion is carving these sediments out, exposing these ancient surfaces with the monkeys and the hippos and everything else, thousands of bones and artifacts all over the surface, and there's one guy, one guy in the world. If I had to say, get that guy out here on the surface, he's going to find the hominy. You know who that is? That is Campiro Carento, the world's greatest fossil finder. This is Campiro Carento. He is one of the world's experts, if not the world's expert. He's the guy I want on the aircraft to find things. He can recognize what's an antelope, what's a carnivore, what's a fish, what's a baboon, what's a zebra, what's a giraffe, what's a rhino. He can scout all that. Not from the whole animal, because you never find the whole animal. You find pieces of animal, pieces of the bones of animals. He knows what they are. Anything thin? More pieces for the puzzle. Cranial vault piece, freshly out of the ground. That one needs to be squirted off. Mm -hmm. This bone is beautifully preserved, completely solidified, completely fossilized. So we've got now a number of different elements. The most diagnostic and important one ultimately will be this one here, which is the top of the left orbit to sort of place it in Clive's head. Whereabouts? Other side. There you go. Okay. I'm looking into the eye of a Paleolithic them? hominid that lived here. So it's a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Mm, one could argue that those, those two pieces fit back together. That's a nice fit. In evolutionary terms, here in the middle Awash, we have six million years worth of rocks. The ones on the bottom have small brain, early bipeds. These are close to the top of the succession. These are much more like you and I. They have chins, vertical foreheads. We still have a lot to learn about them, but the importance for humanity is that this is the right time, 100,000 years ago, and the right place, Africa, according to the archeology span and the genetic evidence, to know the people who were the ones who expanded from Africa to Asia, to Europe, and then beyond. While these people were living here in tropical Africa, dining on hippos, Europe was locked under ice. Let's go get more pieces. Can we, are we ready to rock and roll? Let's get brushes. We've taken all of the surface exposed bone off the surface. We suspect there's going to be subsurface bone in here. We've maximized where we think it is, and now it's a matter of going to the casino and rolling the dice and hoping we're going to get some nice human anatomy fossilized for 100,000 years right out of this unit. But we're just going to brush and find bone.
Whoa! There's a piece of bone right there. And that one's not identifiable, but it might join other ones and become identifiable. So that's a keeper. Every single piece of bone is a keeper. Piece piece. So that's a limb bone shaft. I can't tell which limb bone is one of three. It's tibia, humerus, or femur. Here we go. That's a nice shaft piece. Again, it's tibia. It's one of the major long bones. This one, this one, or that one. You can see these things are, they're, they're completely turned to stone. They're completely fossilized. So they're brittle. And when erosion comes and exposes them, they just shatter. And so we have to be careful to get all of the shattered pieces. My skeleton has 206 bones. Same with this person. They're human. But now we're looking for literally probably 4,000 pieces because all of those bones each shattered. I, I can always already see something that discriminates you and I, which is we've been here the same amount of time. You've pulled out half a dozen of these uh, bone fragments. I haven't found anything. This is clearly an expertise that goes with this business. But the greatest thing about the game is the combination of the expertise and the luck, like Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas! Courtesy of the Zayu. The Zayu! Got a limbo shaft. Thank you. What's wrong over there, Clive? <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That's a check. Check oh, it out! Clive! What is it, Fancy? Check it out. This is a distal humerus. Definitely hominid. It is right down at the end of your upper arm bone. So if we were to place this in our anatomy, we'd set it up something like that. I, I figured out, Tim, I'm, I'm holding the brush one. It's because there's got to be something wrong with my technique here. <laughs> Come on, Clive. Move over into the hot place there. I'm moving KK out. This is your chance. This is your chance. You gotta get in here, man. This guy's finding everything. <laughs> he clapped it up. <laughs> it's just to make me look bad, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sick of volcanology. Right, man. Right, she's going to lose this, right? Piece after piece after piece after piece. Maybe we'll get it all back together again. If we're lucky. If Clive would just find something. We're not going to give up. Come on, Clive. Such a relief. Just out of the dirt. Where it's been a hundred thousand years, maybe. A piece of my direct ancestor, perhaps. It's quite heavy. It's, it's uh, fossilized. One skeleton from Kenya. One skeleton from two meters up. 500 meters away in the middle outwash, and this one. That's how rare even partial skeletons of human ancestors are in that time interval. Just the first surface sweep, we've probably got another 30 pieces of this individual, and all of this came out in about 30 minutes of simply sweeping. As these piles that we've swept up go through the sieve, we're going to have a bunch of other pieces of bone that escape the brushing, but won't escape our sieve. Hopefully we'll see a cranium take shape and we'll come to know the anatomy of this person. I just, what a phenomenal cornucopia for half an hour's work with a dustpan and brush. Uh, just, just sensational. One of three in Africa ever recovered. The timing was very good. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute. There's a console dance going on here in the background. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Oh, boy, I mean, in our Varenia, head. <laughs> you got the Moya. Woo! Yes! Oh, Moya. <laughs> 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 
The extraction begins. This fragment is of particular importance as it is part of the cranium. Time for a, a Shakespearean moment, perhaps. Soliloquies on my deep ancestry. I can see the curvature. It's the biggest piece we have so far. As dusk came, we made our way to the volcano. Looking into the magma at night, the interior of our planet reveals its strange beauty. Ethiopia, Iceland's history is a mere blip in time. Less than 1,200 years ago, it was settled by Norsemen. All of Iceland is volcanic, including the Westman Islands to the south. Out of nowhere, in the early morning hours of January 23rd, 1973, a trench of fire opened right at the edge of the town of Heimei. The eruption occurred without any previous warning signs. fleet had just returned to harbor and rescued many of the inhabitants. Forty years after the event, Clive Oppenheimer brought us here. Grass has grown again and there are still curtains in the windows. But Heimei was hardly an isolated event. Not a season goes by in Iceland without an eruption. happened in 2010 and is remembered as the ash cloud that paralyzed air traffic for weeks. Very quickly, the heat from the eruption melted the thick ice covering on top of the mountain, creating enormous floods. in Iceland. This area is the site of the so-called Lucky eruption. Beginning on June 8, 1783, 
this entire landscape exploded into flames, as far as the eye could see from horizon to horizon. The molten rock came up to the surface and rent open a 27 kilometer long fissure that stretches in this direction for something like half of that distance. Overall, about 140 vents were active, uh, building up cones above them with fire fountains rising into the air. And after a few months, the fissure opened up in this direction, again another 13, 14 kilometers or so. Another few dozen vents opened up, and they spewed out lava to the northeast of us. Everything we see now has been set in stone. The lava has solidified and frozen, but if we'd been here at the time, we would have seen jets of fire, fountains of fire, rising a kilometer and a half into the air, and then cascading down to the ground again. And that built up the cones, like the one that we're standing on now. And from the bases of these cones, lava gushed out at a phenomenal rate. This is very, very hot lava, very, very fluid, and it poured down the valleys, filling them to depths of 100, 150 meters. These primordial occurrences influence the sense of mythical poetry of the Icelanders. There is a text that defines the spirit of the people. It exists only in a single manuscript. For Iceland, it is as important as the Dead Sea Scrolls are for Israel. The Codex was given as a present to the King of Denmark by an Icelandic bishop in the 17th century, hence its name, the Royal Codex or Codex Regius. In 1971, Denmark returned it to Iceland. Knowing that it constituted the soul of the country, the Codex was put on Denmark's largest battleship and escorted by a whole fleet. No amount of money in the world would be enough to purchase this manuscript from Iceland, although it is battered and crumpled and filled with holes. In the opening passage called the Prophecy of the Seeress, there is an apocalyptic vision of the end of the pagan gods. This seems to describe a huge volcanic event. Neath the sea, the land sinketh, the sun dimmeth, from the heavens fall the fair bright stars, gush it forth steam and gutting fire, to very heaven soar the hurtling flames. The fates I fathom, yet farther I see, of the mighty gods, the engulfing doom. Comes the darksome dragon flying, Neathhog, upwards from the Neatha fells. He bears in his pinions, as the plains he overflies, naked corpses. Now he will sink. Right on the border with China lies a volcano in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, better known in the West as North Korea. It has been inactive for more than 1,000 years, but it plays a huge role in the imagination of the people. For millennia, it was considered the mythical birthplace of the Korean nation. Today, the socialist government co-opts this myth. This is the site of pilgrimages. Out of the mists, we saw a formation of uniformed men with a flag emerging. 
We believed they were soldiers, but it turned out they were university students come to rejoice in the power that emanates from this place. And now they are singing in praise of Mount Pektu. Everything is different in North Korea. Imagine if these were students at a campus in California. Opportunity presented itself to us. The near impervious country opened its doors to a joint scientific program between the University of Cambridge and North Korean volcanologists. And so we were invited to film there. <laughs> But everything we saw was an act of presentation and we went for it. There is no other way to see this enigmatic country other than how it wants to present itself. In propaganda films seen frequently on North Korean television, the images display monumental unity and fervent emotion all dedicated to the leadership. One thing that's remarkable and I'm very aware of as I work here is, is the sanctity of this mountain. This has a very long history going back 5,000 years as the mythical birthplace of the Korean people from this volcano. And through the medieval period and to the more modern period, this is the sacred mountain of the revolution where the struggle was fought against Japanese occupation 70 years ago. And the, the spirit of the mountain is in all the Korean people. And this is something very, very special about this place. It seems like we're on a tranquil boat trip on a Norwegian fjord, but actually we're at ground zero of this, what was a most monumental volcanic eruption nearly 1100 years ago, the so-called Millennium Eruption. The crater here is about three miles across, and actually these cliffs are all part of the crater rim all around us, 360 degrees. The amount of pumice that came out of the eruption would be enough to bury the whole of New York City. Only the highest buildings would poke out of the top. In a way, if you look at the crater surrounding us, and imagine that once there was a cone built over our heads, uh, that missing volume alone accounts for, for a huge amount of, of rock and pumice and lava. So this has been spewed out over the uh, Korean Peninsula, it's in parts of China, it's in parts of Russia, and there's even uh, about three inches of ash that fell over parts of Japan that you can still find today. Around 10 years ago, there was a swarm of earthquakes that were detected by sensitive instruments around the mountain, and that really ignited the scientific interest in the volcano and whether there might be signs of reawakening. Over the last few years, we've built a really strong and unique collaboration with scientists from Pyongyang who've worked here for 10, 20 years. So they have very detailed knowledge of the structure of the volcano, so we've learned a lot from them. It's very difficult for scientists here to attend international conferences. So we've really shared our experiences and expertise to better understand this volcano. 
so two years of data. So yeah, we collected in two years a scientific paper, um, which is pretty incredible. Um, we, and so the seismometer sitting here, we record all the earthquakes. It doesn't look, it looks just like a, a paint pot uh, linked to a laptop, and, and, and yet that's, that's recorded this unique data set. It's, uh, it's yeah. really something. It looks can be deceptive. It's, it's an incredibly sensitive uh, instrument um, in there. So it'll record, you know, um, just minor movements, even us walking around here will, will be creating noise. So this is Mr. Yun Yang Gun, he's the Vice Director of the Earthquake Administration and kind of leads the DPRK side of the project. The Earthquake Administration of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea pays special attention to this process of international joint research. Greater importance is given to this mountain just because around this mountain a great leader President Kim Il sung fought about against the Japanese imperialists. Kim Il sung, the founding father of the communist North Korean state, appropriated the myth of the volcano. He established his secret military headquarters in a forest right here at the foot of the mountain thus transferring its power and dynamic into his revolution. This monument is a gateway to the sacred ground. This group sculpture is about the camping life of the gorillas in Songbong camp. They were very much moved to put their foot first time on the homeland and they could not sleep. So you can see the lady gorillas who are now sewing the buttons to the clothes, uh, a gorilla who is reading a book under the fire. Little Gorilla is now dreaming about returning back home after the liberation of the country and one of the gorilla is now playing the pipe. Those gorillas are now rejoicing over the site of Mount Baekdu. On the 21st of July 1979, our great leader, General Lismo Kim Jong-il, came to this place and particularly highly appreciated that that lady who is now standing in solitude was greatly depicted. And this is the biggest lake number one. And over there we have the lake number two. And a little further up we have the lake number three. When our great leader General Lismo Kim Jong-il came here in March 2003, he highly appreciated the beauty of these trees. <laughs> This is the mosaic mural painting, The Glory of February. The mural painting represents the great leader President Kim Il sung and the anti Japanese heroine Kim Jong Su, who are celebrating the first birth anniversary of the great leader Kim Jong il. And here, the secret log cabin of Kim Il sung. Daily thousands of people make their pilgrimage to this humble place. In the Christian world, this would be like visiting the birthplace of Jesus, the stable in Bethlehem. For North Koreans, the founding father of their revolution still lives on. Kim Il sung became president of the nation and then president for life. After his death, he was declared president for eternity. The propaganda appears to create a quasi-religious experience. Actually, the life in the secret camp in those days was so difficult that they had no blanket at all. That is why the guerrilla soldiers they collected their 
clad awards from their own padded clothes and then uh, made that blanket for our dear Kim Jong Il. The birthplace of the socialist revolution manifests itself in collective formations of the North Koreans. In the country's biggest stadium, more than 100,000 people participate in creating a unique art form. The picture of the hut in the snow is not a painting. It is made of human pixels. And this is how it's done. A pre-arranged pattern of colored cards is held and flipped over in sync. Here, the rising sun over the landscape of Mount Pektu. And here, father and son of the revolution. All this appears like a cosmic metaphor for a society aligned in a unified pattern behind a common ideology. But in all this display of the masses, I find an underlying emptiness and solitude. Because of the North Korean ideology of political and economic self-reliance, and because of internationally imposed sanctions, the country is unique. The population at large has very limited contact with the outside world. There are no international phone lines or internet available to the public. No radio or television from the outside world. To our eyes, it is strange to see people not glued to their cell phones. There is no advertising anywhere. Instead, just the ever-present propaganda. There are no newsstands, only the official party newspaper on display. In the subway, in the streets, almost everywhere, you'll find pictures of the leaders always in the vicinity of the volcano. Back on the mountain, we spoke to a historian who was assigned to us. We asked him about the photos in the precise location of where they had been taken. He probably stood exactly at the place you are standing now. 기령님께서 지금 우리가 서 있는 이 자리에 어제서 사진을 찍으셨습니까? 이 자리는 아니고 저 어떤 분이 계신 분인데 저 저기는 not this place but up there on the Dunkin' Cake. Yeah, they're yeah, famous photos, you know them. About this monument, uh, it dates back to what time, roughly? 이게 언제 지어진 비석입니까? 비석으로서는 이게 지어진 것도 있지만 이 세기 초에 이 세기 초에 it dates back to the early 20th century. It was erected by the heavenly people living around this area, and according to the inscription on the monument, they prayed to Mount Bektu and Lake Tsonghir to give a birth to a prominent person who can give prosperity and happiness to the Korean nation. And the person materialized. This kind of miserable nation 
was restored and saved just by our great leader, the fearless patriot, Kim Il-sung, who fought against the Japanese imperialists. And how do you feel as a historian, with all the thousands of years behind you, how do you feel personally? Is there pride? Is there patriotism? <sighs> My question was meant to elicit a personal response. However, personal opinions seem to us a mirror image of the omnipotent ideology of the people and their leadership. All the Korean people frequently climb up to this mountain, but every time you know, they climb up this mountain, they have a new feeling, a solemn feeling, and at the same time, they make up a new determination to work harder for the country with patriotism. And uh, all the Korean people are now singing the song, which whose title is "Let Us Go to Mount Baekdu," and it clearly reflects the spirit of the Korean people. <laughs> We are back now where we started, the Vanuatu Archipelago, this time on Tana Island in the south. There is an active volcano here, Mount Yasmu. Volcano has created a new god. The name of the deity, John Frum, a mythical American GI who descended from the clouds. Each Friday night, the islanders celebrate his cult.
Chief Isaac of this Son Fran village tightly controls the dogma of the new faith. Different denominations and even a schism in the church seem to have materialized, and so we were only allowed to speak to him and his son. He flies the stars and stripes because John Fram is an American who promises to return with copious cargoes of consumer goods. I understand that John Fram one day will appear to all the people and that he will bring many things, chewing gum, fridges, Cadillacs, maybe Boeing airplanes. He thinks that, uh, he says that it is a promise that uh, was made that one day. In. In. He says that uh, it is a promise that made by the spirit that one day it will be like the American will do all that. Is John from like a god? Mm -hmm. uh, John Brum is like a god to us. The one god. And I got me much on the wind swaru. John Brum is like a god and it is like the wind swaru. When it's when you threw Jesus, God on pass on him, was in the matter. Like John Brum is like, it's like, a, it's like a cape. It is like Jesus. You have to pass through before going to God. What happens when people die? His believing is that when dead are buried, they are in a room waiting for the last kingdom. Will they meet John from in the last kingdom? Can you see by meeting John from in the last kingdom? Last kingdom, I don't know what you So he thinks that uh, like the last kingdom. Like John Broom is like a walking person, like Jesus, the last kingdom, it is God that will be touching the people. His son had direct encounters with John Frum. You're next in line to be chief of this John Frum village, and I understand that you have spent time living in the volcano. You spent some nights there. What, what were you doing, and did you speak to John Frum while you were there? Mm -hmm. Uh, he's answering that yes, he's been there and uh, he stayed there for one full night. Met him And he has seen someone and he spoke to him. We, it said that John Frum uses the volcano as a, a portal, a, a doorway to travel from Tana to America. Does John Frum live inside the volcano? John? Come on, Jesus. Now. He's telling us that uh, John Prum has a special room that he's living in it, but there is one day that we will meet him in a different form of a person like Jesus. When I was on the volcano, I found it amazing to watch, but also quite terrifying. How did you feel spending a whole night up in the crater? Were you afraid? He's telling us that uh, when he went there and spent the night, he wasn't afraid because he knows that that is God. And uh, he's the one that's allowing him to go there. <laughs> So he went inside the volcano and he saw him and he spoke to him. They had a conversation. Are you allowed to tell us what the conversation was about? He says that the, the message that the, the spirit gave to him, he didn't tell to his father and even the followers that uh, following the chanting. It is only for him. I'm a volcano man. You can't whisper it to me in my ear. Thank <laughs> you.
it is hard to take your eyes off the fire that burns deep under our feet. Everywhere, under the crust of the continents and seabeds. It is a fire that wants to burst forth, and it could not care less about what we are doing up here. This boiling mass is just monumentally indifferent to scurrying roaches, retarded reptiles, and vapid humans alike. When I went there, I started to walk to the lava lake. I didn't think that uh, I would see something like what I saw. And once I looked down there, I thought that I was looking at the sea water, but it was rain, and I didn't understand. I started to think about why there is a water there, and the water is red, and I didn't understand. I thought of perhaps this, this fire but something came through the sea water. So I was very frightened. According to our culture, I think the volcano will, will destroy everything. I, I, I believe that, which I heard about from various people that the uh, there are volcanoes around the world, and I think that uh, I believe that someday this volcano will erupt, and the one at Vol uh, Low Baby, and then will join together, will burn everybody. This is what I'm thinking of. I think everything will, will melt. That's what I'm thinking. Everything will melt. The stone, the soil trees and everything will melt, like water. That's why I believe that uh, this volcano will destroy this world someday. <laughs>